Sutra. The Bodhisattva in that way becomes disgusted with and leaves behind all that is conditioned. He in that way is sympathetically mindful of all living beings. He knows the supreme benefits of the wisdom of all wisdom. He wishes to use the first common's wisdom to rescue and cross over living beings. He makes the following reflection. All these living beings have fallen into the midst of the great sufferings of afflictions. What expedients can be used to pull them out and save them so they attain the bliss of ultimate nirvana? Then he makes the following reflection. One wishing to cross over living beings, so they dwell within nirvana does not separate from an obstructed wisdom of liberation. An obstructed wisdom of liberation is not separate from awakening to the reality of all dharmas. Awakening to the reality of all dharmas is not separate from the light of wisdom of non-doing and non-production. The light of wisdom of non-doing and non-production is not separate from investigation, though the wisdom of clever, through the wisdom of clever, decisive contemplation, investigation through the wisdom of clever, decisive contemplation is not separate from skilled learning. Commentary the Bodhisattva in that way becomes disgusted with and leaves behind all that is conditioned. That's how the Bodhisattva comes really to despise all conditioned dharmas, and so he wants to leave all conditioned dharmas behind. He in that way is sympathetically mindful of all living beings. That's how he feels so beautiful living beings and remembers them with pity. He knows the supreme benefits of the wisdom of all wisdom, that the wisdom of all wisdoms has a supremely beneficial advantages. He wishes to use the first common's wisdom, the wisdom of a Sadagata, to rescue and cross over living beings. All living beings within the six paths, he makes the following reflection, thinking yet again. All these living beings have fallen into the midst of the great suffering of afflictions and that caused trouble and difficulty. What expedients can be used to pull them out and save them? What kind of expedient dormitories can I use to pluck out and rescue all those living beings so they attain the bliss of ultimate nirvana? So that they obtain non-production and non-extinction, neither defilement nor purity, permanence, bliss, true self, and purity, which is the happiness of ultimate nirvana. Then he makes the following reflection, contemplating in this way, one wishing to cross over living beings, one who wants to cross over all living beings, so they dwell within Nirvana, so they reside in the principle and substance of Nirvana, does not separate from an obstructed wisdom of liberation. One should not leave wisdom of liberation, which is an obstructed. If one has an obstructed wisdom of liberation, one can cause all living beings to be free from suffering and attain bliss. It is not separate from awakening to the reality of all dramas. One should not separate from the awakening to the true thirstness of all dramas. If one can manage not to separate from awakening to the reality of all dramas, then one can cause all living beings to turn back from confusion and return to enlightenment, for it is not separate from the light of wisdom of non-doing and non-production. It is not separate from the light of wisdom of doors of practice such that there is nothing that is cultivated and one certifies to patience with the non-production of dharmas. The light of wisdom of non-doing and non-production has nothing that is practiced and nothing that is produced is the wisdom light of that kind of behavior and it is not separate from investigation through the wisdom of clever, decisive contemplation. 
It is not separate from wisdom which skillfully investigates through decisive contemplation. With the investigation through the wisdom of clever, decisive contemplation, then one can truly not throw the end birth and death. It is not separate from skilled learning. Sutra after the Bodhisattva in that way contemplates and thoroughly understands, he doubles his diligent search for and practice of proper dharmas. Day and night, he only wishes to hear the drama, delights in the drama, relies upon the drama, follows the drama, reaches the drama, dwells in the drama, and cultivates the drama. The Bodhisattva, in that way, diligently seeks the Buddha drama. He does not begrudge any of his gems or wealth. He does not see that there is any object difficult to obtain or estimable, but has the thought that only someone who is able to speak the Buddha Dharma is difficult to meet. Therefore, the Bodhisattva in his search for the Buddha Dharma is completely able to give up all inner and out wealth. There is no reverence. He is unable to practice. There is no pride, he is unable to renounce. There is no service, he is unable to perform. There is no suffering, he is unable to undergo. If he hears a single phrase of drama that he has not heard before, he becomes more delighted than if he obtained precious jewels that fill the 3,000 great thousand world system. Commentary after the Bodhisattva in that way contemplates and thoroughly understands when the Bodhisattva has made those kinds of contemplations and gains clear understanding. Then after that, he doubles his diligent search for and practice of proper dharmas. He doubly intensifies his diligence in seeking and practicing proper dharma. Day and night, he only wishes to hear the dharma. In the daytime and at night as well, all he wants to do is listen to the Buddha Dharma. He delights in the Buddha Dharma. He likes the Buddha Dharma. He relies upon the Buddha Dharma to cultivate. He follows at a cost with the Buddha Dharma to rescue and cross over all living beings. He clearly understands the Buddha Dharma and teaches and transforms all living beings. He accords with the Dharma, following and according with the real mark of all Dharmas, and he reaches the Dharma, the other shore of all Dharmas. He dwell in, dwells in the Nirvana of Dharma and cultivates the unconditioned aspect of all Dharma. The Bodhisattva in that way diligently seeks the Buddha Dharma. He does not begrudge any of his dreams or wealth. He would never think of being unable to give them up. He does not see that there is any object, any possession that is difficult to obtain or estimable. He doesn't see any articles as very hard to possess or valuable, but has the thought that only someone who is able to speak the Buddha Dharma is difficult to meet. Only toward a person who can speak Buddha Dharma does he bring forth the thought that such a person is difficult to encounter and difficult to meet. Therefore, the Bodhisattva in his search for the Buddha Dharma is completely able to give up all inner and outer wealth. He can give both the inner and outer wealth away in order to seek the Buddha Dharma. There is no reverence. He is unable to practice. There is no act of respect or veneration he would not be able to bring himself to do. There is no pride he is unable to renounce. There is no kind of arrogance he would not be able to let go of. There is no service he is unable to perform. He would never say, I can't possibly attend upon and serve all Buddhas. There is no suffering he is unable to undergo. There isn't any toil of which he would say, I can't stand it. If he hears a single phrase of Dharma that he has not heard before, upon hearing that one sentence of Dharma he had never before heard, he becomes more delighted than if 
he obtained the precious jewels that fill a three thousand great thousand watt system. His joy is greater than if he came into possession of all the precious jewels in an entire Chichi Leocosm. Sutra, if he hears one verse of proper Dharma he has never heard before, he becomes more delighted than if he obtained the position of real turning sage king. If he obtains one verse of Dharma he has never heard before, which can purify the Bodhisattva conduct, it surpasses obtaining the royal positions of Chakra and Brahma and remaining in them, fully meet these hundreds of thousands of compass. If a person were to say to him, I have a phrase of Dharma spoken by the Buddha that can purify the Bodhisattva conduct, if you can now enter a great pit of fire, and undergo ultimately great suffering, I shall bestow it upon you. The Bodhisattva at that time makes the following reflection. Since with a single phrase of Dharma spoken by the Buddha, I can purify the Bodhisattva conduct if the three thousand great thousand world system were filled with massive fire, I would even be willing to hurt my body down hold my body down from the top of the Brahma heaven to endure it. So how much less is there question of whether I can enter a small pit of fire? For now, uh, to seek the Buddha Dharma, I should undergo all the sufferings of the house, much less the small vexations in the realm of humans. Commentary The Bodhisattva, if he hears as little as one sentence of Buddha Dharma, that he hasn't ever heard before, becomes very happy and feels more content than if he obtained an entire great trichy leocosm filled with precious jewels. If he hears one verse, most verses being four line gathers of proper drama that he has never heard before, although those drama he has never listened to, he also becomes very happy, more delighted than if he obtained the position of willow turning sage king. When you listen to sutras and heard the Dharma, you need to know how to apply that Dharma. You listen to the sutras and hear the Dharma every day, and you sort of get tired of it. So there is true natural Dharma, but you don't recognize it, and you don't feel the Dharma's value and importance. But the Bodhisattva isn't that way. The Bodhisattva, if he hears just one phrase of Buddha Dharma that he hasn't heard before, or else a single gather whose principles he never understood before and now gets to hear, he likes it better than if he got to be a real turning sage king. If he obtains one verse of Dharma he has never heard before, which can purify the Bodhisattva conduct, Purify means perfect the conduct of a bodhisattva. It surpasses obtaining the royal positions of chakra and brahma. It's great happiness for him than if he received the kingly positions of the god chakra or the great brahma heaven god. First, it was the jewels in a great chichi leocosm. Next, the position of will turning sage king, and now it surpasses obtaining the positions of kingship well held by the god chakra and the great Brahma heaven god, and remaining in them for the midless hundreds of thousands of compass. It is better than enjoying the reward of blessings of the god chakra and the great Brahma heaven god throughout unlimited hundreds of thousands of compass. If a person were to say to him, I have a phrase of Dharma spoken by the Buddha, I now have just one sentence of Dharma spoken by the Buddha in the past that can purify the Bodhisattva conduct. It can purify and regulate the doors of practice cultivated by Bodhisattvas. If you can now enter a great bit of fire, if right now, in your search for the Dharma, you can cast yourself into a huge fiery pit and undergo ultimately great suffering, the most intense bitterness, suffering within suffering, I shall bestow it upon you. If you can do that, it proves you have 
real sincerity, and I will transmit the single phrase of Buddha Dharma to you. The Bodhisattva at that time, the Bodhisattva who is cultivating the Bodhisattva way, when that happens, makes the following reflection. Since with a single phrase of Dharma spoken by the Buddha, because of that one sentence of Buddha Dharma, I can purify the Bodhisattva conduct. I can purify and regulate the doors of practice cultivated by a Bodhisattva. If the 3,000 great thousand world system were filled with a massive fire, should the great Chichi Leo Kozum turn into a huge pit of fire, I would even be willing to hold my body down from the top of the Brahma heaven. In order to seek that one phrase of Buddha Dharma, I would be willing to jump from the top of the great Brahma heaven down into the great pit of fire and endure it. Myself undergo being physically burned by the fire of the pit in exchange for the Buddha Dharma. So how much less is there a question of whether I can enter a small pit of fire? There is even less question about my being able to jump into a tiny little pit of fire in search of the Dharma. For now, to seek the Buddha Dharma, I should undergo all the sufferings of the house much less the small vexations in the realm of humans. I would willingly renounce my body in that way in order to seek the Buddha Dharma, even if I had to endure all the sufferings in the house in order to do so, I would still seek the Dharma spoken by the Buddha, and so the minor torments and vexations, such as a little fiery pit in the human realm, are even less of a problem. Even if I have to give up my body and life, I absolutely wish to seek the Buddha Dharma. Sutra The Bodhisattva in that way rouses up diligence and vigor in his search for the Buddha Dharma in accord with what he hears, he contemplates and cultivates. Once this Bodhisattva comes to hear the Dharma, he collects his mind and dwells secured. In a quiet and tranquil place, he makes the following reflection. It is by practicing as is spoken that one obtains the Buddha Dharma. Merely talking cannot make one pure. Disciples of the Buddha, when that Bodhisattva dwells upon this ground of emitting light, he dwells in the first dhyana, having become free from desires and from evil and unwholesome dramas, possessing reflection and possessing consideration in the joy of separation from production. He dwells in the second dhyana, having extinguished reflection and consideration with the inner purity and singleness of mind, devoid of reflection and consideration in the joy of production of samadhi. He dwells in the third dhyana, having separated from joy, dwelling in renunciation while still possessing thought and proper knowledge so that his experience of personal bliss is as described by all sages. The bliss of renunciation while still possessing thought. He dwells in the fourth dhyana, having severed bliss by first expelling suffering and then extinguishing joy and sorrow, feeling neither suffering nor bliss in the purity of renunciation of thought. Commentary The Bodhisattva forgets about himself for the sake of the Dharma. He is able to renounce his body and life to seek the Buddha Dharma, and he in that way rouses up diligence and vigor in his search for the Buddha Dharma. In order to seek the Buddha Dharma in accord with what he hears, he wants to put what he has heard into practice. He contemplates and cultivates, investigating and bit by bit actually doing the work of cultivation. Once this Bodhisattva comes to hear the Dharma, after the Bodhisattva in question has heard the Buddha Dharma, he collects his mind and dwells secured. He gathers in and collects his body and mind and dwells secured within that Buddha Dharma in a quiet and tranquil place, in a very still and quiet location, empty and retired, and where there are no people, he makes the following reflection. 
he thinks this way in the course of his cultivation, saying, It is by practicing the Buddha Dharma as it is spoken that one obtains the Buddha Dharma. One needs to cultivate according to the Dharma spoken by the Buddha, and it is in that way that one can certify to the attainment of the states of the Buddha Dharma. Merely talking cannot make on pure, is not by chanting Buddha Dharma, Buddha Dharma from morning to night with one's mouth and not cultivating, just mouthing Buddha Dharma but not practicing that one obtains purity. Disciples of the Buddha, all of you, when that Bodhisattva dwells upon this ground of emitting light, the third ground, he dwells in the first dhyana, having become free from his eyes and from evil and unwholesome dramas, one leaves behind thoughts of desire, and uh, all of one's evil reflections and considerations of evil wisdom, and the devil knowledge and devil views of unwholesome dramas, possessing reflection and possessing consideration. He has that kind of reflective process and consideration, yet he wants to leave behind all evil reflection and consideration. That means evil advisors, not good advisors. This is the first dhyana that he certifies to the stage of the joy of separation from production, also called dwelling in the joy of separation from production. He dwells in the second dhyana, having extinguished reflection and consideration. He eradicates all evil reflections and considerations with inner purity and singleness of mind. Inside, he is pure and of one mind, devoid of reflection and consideration. He doesn't have any of those evil reflections and considerations. At that time, samadhi arises. It is the stage of the joy of the production of samadhi, also called dwelling in the joy of production of samadhi, the second dhyana in which samadhi is produced. He dwells in the third dhyana, having separated from joy. He leaves joy behind, dwelling in renunciation, while still possessing thought and proper knowledge. He has a kind of thought, has proper knowledge, so that his experience of personal bliss, a kind of ecstasy, is as he is described by all sages. The bliss of renunciation, while still possessing thought, the first dhyana is the stage of joy of separation from production. The second dhyana is the stage of joy of production of samadhi. The third dhyana is the stage of wonderful bliss of separation from joy. The fourth dhyana is the stage of purity of renunciation of thought. He has certified to the third dhyana. He dwells in the fourth dhyana, having severed bliss by first expelling suffering, and then extinguishing joy and sorrow. He cuts off all bliss, the stage of wonderful bliss from separation from joy. If he can go on to destroy all suffering, joy and sorrow, feeling neither suffering nor bliss, at that time he reaches the stage of dwelling in the purity of renunciation of thought, the fourth dhyana.